Hi, it's time for another verb of the day. Today's verb is prescribe. Let's take a look at some of the definitions or ways that we use this verb. The first way you're likely to hear the verb prescribe used is to mean to advise and authorize the use of medicine for someone. Generally, when we're using this verb, the authorization, the approval, is being given in writing to someone. Now, there are many professions that can prescribe medication. Most people think of doctors, um, and we'll look at some other examples a little later in the video. A second way you might hear the verb prescribe used is to mean to recommend a substance or an action as being good or beneficial. When many people think of this verb prescribe, they're thinking of that first definition and a particular medicine, but uh, many doctors might prescribe or uh, recommend other actions or treatments um, that can help someone improve their health or well-being. A third way you might hear the verb prescribe used is to mean to state something as a rule that should be carried out. With this particular uh, definition, I think of someone with great authority saying, this is what we need to do. Um, this usage, not quite as common, but you might encounter it as you're studying political science, history, etc. Um, in a co collegiate course. You should know that prescribe is a regular verb. To make the progressive tense, we're going to drop the E and then add ing to form prescribing. The past tense and participle forms of this verb are made by just adding the letter D, since this verb already ends in an E. The base verb prescribe b, b, ends in this B sound. So our ED is going to make uh, a D sound, prescribed, prescribed. You'll be happy to know we don't have any additional phrasal verbs that will significantly alter these meanings that we just talked about. So uh, that's going to allow us to spend some more time talking uh, about our verb of the day in um, the active voice and the passive voice. But let's start with a little bit of a review of active and passive. You should know that sentences most commonly are uh, written or spoken in the active voice, meaning they start with the person or the thing that is responsible for an action. Two examples of this could be Mike has cleaned the house. Jen has planted vegetables. In the first sentence, I know that Mike is responsible for the action of cleaning. In the second sentence, I know Jen is responsible for the action of planting. Now, sometimes in English, you will either hear or see sentences that are written in the passive voice. A sentence in the passive voice is beginning with the person or thing that is receiving the action or that is being acted on. The person who is responsible for the action might not be included in the sentence, but if they are included, they're going to come at the end, usually after the preposition by. So we can take our first two examples and change them from active voice to passive voice. The house has been cleaned, right? I could also add the house has been cleaned by Mike. Those would um, both have the same meaning. The second sentence, Jen has planted vegetables. To change that, we're going to start with vegetables. That's the thing that was acted on. Vegetables have been planted or vegetables have been planted by Jen. Those both work. Now, many students will ask, why are we using passive voice? And, and there can be a few different reasons why someone might choose to, to either write or speak in the passive voice. 
The first reason is that the person who is responsible for the action or the people who are responsible for an action, they may not be known. So we don't know who to say is responsible for it. A second reason is the person who's doing the action just isn't that important. Um, and that sort of connects to the third reason. So if, our, uh, uh, if a writer or speaker really wants to emphasize or put the attention on the thing or person that's being acted on, it can help draw your listeners or readers attention by beginning your sentence with uh, that thing or person being acted on. A fourth reason the passive voice is sometimes used is when we don't want to blame someone else or maybe even blame ourselves for uh, a mistake, right? It's, uh, perhaps easier or more comfortable to say mistakes were made versus I made a mistake. So now that we've had this little review, we're going to compare present perfect in the active voice to present perfect in the passive voice. You may remember we use the passive, uh, we used the present perfect verb tense, pardon me, to describe an action that started in the past and continues into the present. Or we might use it to describe something that happened at an indefinite or unknown time period. So uh, we're going to look at affirmative in the active voice and then the passive, and then we'll work through the other examples like that. So let's start with affirmative sentences. In the active voice, to make a present perfect sentence, we're going to use have or has, depending on what our subject is, and then we use the participle form of the verb. So an example of this could be, the nurse practitioner has prescribed a new medication for me. So in this sentence, we know the nurse practitioner is responsible for the action of prescribing or writing out an authorization for a particular medication. In the passive voice, the, the structure for present perfect is again to start with have or has. Then we're going to use the participle been, B-E-E-N, and then the participle form of our verb. So uh, to change the first example to passive voice, I would just say, I have been prescribed a new medication. So um, again, we don't know who's responsible for that action and it might not matter. Right? If you don't know my doctor or my nurse practitioner, you don't really care if I include them in that sentence. Now let's look at making negative sentences. In the active voice in present perfect, we need to insert not after have or has, and then we'll follow that with the participle form of the verb. Here's another example. Doctors haven't prescribed that medicine for me. So, um, I borrowed this sentence from various articles that will always say things like, if you haven't been prescribed a particular medication, don't take it because um, different things can have different reactions uh, based on people's body composition, so how tall they are, how much uh, weight um, they have, etc. So a good piece of advice. I can take that same sentence though and make it passive voice. Again, maybe it doesn't matter who is giving this advice. It's just generally good. So in this case, I'm again going to start with have or has, whichever matches my subject. Then I'll use not, then been, then the participle. That medicine hasn't been prescribed for you. Okay, so it has not been authorized for you. Now, let's take a look at making yes or no questions. In the active voice, again, we'll start with have or has, then we'll have our subject, so the person, who's person or people who are responsible for the action, and then we'll use the participle form of the verb. Here's another example. Have lawmakers prescribed detailed guidelines to address the problem? So here's a sentence that is tying back to that third definition of the verb. So um, connected to recommendations. Now I can take that same sentence, and again, maybe we know we're talking about legislators, lawmakers, government officials. Um, so maybe that just isn't important. 
but we, I really want uh, someone who's listening to me to focus on the object or the thing that's receiving the action, so those guidelines. To do that, again, I'd start with have or has. I'm, I'm using have here because the guidelines is plural. Then I'm going to use been, then the participle form of my verb. Have detailed guidelines been prescribed to address the problem? So here, again, uh, we're looking kind of for a recommendation. Now, let's spend a moment looking at some words that are related to our verb prescribe. And the first word we're going to look at is the noun prescriber. You can probably tell by the suffix, the ending of this word, uh, that ER ending usually means a person who does. So here it's a person who prescribes. Uh, an example of that could be prescribers received gifts from pharmaceutical companies. The word pharmaceutical could be new for you. This is uh, a broad term used to talk about companies who research, develop, and sell different types of medication. Um, and this also kind of describes a problem that exists in many societies, including the U.S., where um, these companies will try to, to give gifts to people so that they write more um, authorizations for their medications. So this prescribers is uh, generally broader than doctors um, because again there are um, different qualifications that allow someone to write or authorize uh, another person's use of a medication or treatment. The next word we're going to look at is the noun prescription. This can have a couple different meanings. We're just going to focus on two. And the first is a written document that authorizes a patient to be provided a medicine or a treatment. If you've ever visited a doctor's office, um, you may have been given a little uh, rectangle uh, piece of paper that you then had to take to a pharmacy. And that's what my example sentence here is describing. I need to go to the pharmacy to get my prescription filled. So in this case, I probably have that little piece of paper. I want to turn that paper uh, into actual medicine, right? So pills, uh, a liquid, whatever, whatever it may be in this case. And uh, this is changing a bit as more things um, become automated and electronic. So sometimes uh, a doctor's office may call in a prescription so you don't actually end up with that physical piece of paper. But, but it's still authorization for medicine. A second way you can use the noun prescription is to refer to a remedy or a recommendation. Here's an example of this usage. What are their prescriptions for addressing climate change? Right. So here we're clearly not talking about medicine. That's not going to fix our climate. Uh, but we are asking for maybe a group or um, uh, an organization's ideas, recommendations for fixing this problem. The last word we're going to look at today is the adjective prescriptive. And when we use this, we are describing something uh, and connecting it to the enforcement of a particular rule. So uh, let me give you an example of that, and, and that might help us uh, understand it a bit. The teacher's approach to grammar is quite prescriptive. So in this instance, uh, I am envisioning a teacher that uh, sees things in very black and white, right? meaning there is a right way to write a particular sentence or say a particular sentence, and there is a wrong way. Um, and we have a number of teachers that approach language that way. Um, I think when I first started teaching, I might have been a little in this direction, um, but, but we're all capable of change. And I would say I am less prescriptive today. And what I really think about with my students is, will they be understood, right? Does the sentence have to be perfect? Not always, but... I, I'm looking for comprehension. I think that is more important. So I 
there are times where I, I should say like rules are important for, for certain academic or professional writing. But in more informal situations, I'm not correcting people's grammar. I'm not trying to enforce these rules. Thanks so much for watching today's video. I hope you have a great day.